Thank you, Kevin. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, thank you, uh, Kevin, for the kind words and for that introduction. Uh, so as uh, Kevin said, I'm a, a breeding lead at Dragon Crops at CIMIT. And, and as, as he mentioned, this is a new program we started at CIMIT. Uh, what I would like to do is take a couple of minutes here just to introduce this program to, to all of you and, and also so help you understand you know, how we can work together uh, with CIMIT and the, the CGNARS network uh, we are setting up. So first of all, you know, as many of you heard, uh, through the various uh, social media uh, and through your linkages with CIMIT, that CIMIT has just released this month, uh, 2030 strategy. And in that strategy, you know, we have identified four, uh, five major programs that includes wheat, maize, and which has been our traditional programs at CIMIT, genetic resources, uh, which has been there since many years, and also sustainable agri-food system, which is also a newly formed program, you know, by taking into account other programs which were at CIMIT. And what I've highlighted here is the dryland programs, uh, which is a newly created program at CIMIT just recently. And I would like to encourage you to visit our strategy page uh, on, on CIMIT website. And, and I think what you will find is the dryland crops are quite critical for us to deliver uh, all of the five objectives of CIMIT's new strategy. Um, now, what are we doing to achieve those uh, objectives of the strategies? Uh, and one of the objectives of strategies around partnerships. And, and what we're doing is we're creating a crop improvement networks. So these networks are currently are being created in Africa by bringing together 17 different uh, national agriculture research and extension systems. So these NARS program, you know, have uh, their own breeding programs. And so we're bringing these breeding programs together under the ages of what we are calling, uh, you know, crop improvement networks. So the aim of this uh, crop improvement network is to together design and develop the strategies for those two regions, which are highlighted on the graph here, on the map here, uh, on the right, which are Eastern Southern Africa regions shown in the red color and, and the Western Central Africa region shown in the uh, green color. And the idea here and the mantra is to co-design, co-develop and co-implement. And in this case, CIMIT is catalyzing the development of this network for sorghum, permillate, groundnut, finger millet, pigeon pea and chickpea. And then we're working with our colleagues at IITA and CIAT for cowpea and, and common bean. So millets are our key part of, you know, developing this crop improvement uh, network. So you might ask, you know, why, you know, need of this crop improvement networks. The first and the, I mean, short to medium term need is really, is leveraging, leveraging the complementary strength uh, which exists uh, in, in each of these countries with each of these NARS partner. So what you see on my left, you know, this is a, a pathway to deliver a variety starting from developing a good market segment and product profile and going through development of material and all the way to deliver through the seed system. And what you can see here is different NARS, which are there in these regions have different capacities. The idea here is to really leverage their complementary strengths, uh, which, which we can bring together through this network. And the long-term goal is, you know, uh, as you know, uh, each country should have this capacity for their own food and nutritional security, and especially considering, you know, several natural challenges uh, we face, you know, such as now upcoming climate change or ongoing climate change, and several geopolitical issues, you know, we all face. But the other part is is we need to develop the capacity in the whole region at the system level, which is really the NARS and CGs and various universities and government agencies to work on this crop improvement part. So basically, you know the CG NARS network will really catalyze uh, the development of these capacities and by working towards a common goal. Uh, and then how will we achieve this? Uh, basically, there will be a shared NARS CG crop improvement programs for regional level impact. So basically, these programs between CG and NARS will, will uh, as I said, these programs are coming together. They will together design, you know, if it is a, let's say a sorghum or millet program, uh, how do we, uh, you know, what segments we work on, what kind of breeding pipelines we should have uh, basically. And then also we'll work on developing these overall network capacities in three major areas, essentially making sure the, the products we are developing are on type, uh, you know, are the, what is required by the markets. 
uh, and the process of the variety development itself, such as by using modern breeding approaches, new tools and technologies, and also by improving the seed systems for all of these varieties. And that will lead to basically two uh, uh, outcomes. One is the development of the human and infrastructure capacities at each partner level, and also development of, uh, you know, developing a varieties which are preferred by farmer and consumers and also uh, nutritious. So what we have achieved so far, uh, basically we are able to form this network, uh, you know, which have, we have come together as a, you know, crop and region group, Permulate West Africa group as, as an example here. And then we are in, in the process of forming transdisciplinary teams, you know, such as technical teams for let's say pathology teams uh, for each of these region. And, uh, and we are in process of forming, uh, actually we have formed already the steering committees for each of these uh, regions in Eastern Southern Africa and Western Central Africa that will guide this crop improvement network. On technical side, you know, we have able to achieve various market segments and product profile uh, at each country level, which will be turned into a regional market segment and target product profiles. And then, you know, we are in the process of almost finishing this country and crop breeding programs, you know, to define the gaps and the requirements which will guide what are the capacity development needs are. And on the science side, you know, we have initiated several on projects around fingerprinting of the germplasm and the material, and, and also uh, started defining, you know, what should be our breeding schema look like uh, for this shared breeding program. And this is my last slide, uh, essentially talking about what we're doing at CIMIT to develop this capacity, which is really, uh, we have hired several scientists, we have leveraging existing capacity CIMIT has in, in Kenya, and partnering with other institutes in Senegal. And, and we are also working with several international and local partners to obtain germplasm and the material. So with this, you know, I'd like to stop here and, and, and end my uh, presentation. So thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to this group about it. Thank you very much, uh, Harish, uh, Dr. Harish Gandhi. Uh, let me remind all of you uh, in the audience that there is a Q&A feature that you can type your questions into. Uh, and after the three speakers, we will have several minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Mariam, if you would like to go ahead and start sharing your screen while I introduce you. Uh, Dr. Mariam Abba Dawood conducted her master's study on genetics and plant breeding at the University of Maiduguri, Nigeria. She was the second winner of a pitch innovation competition at the University of Cambridge during those master's studies. She holds a PhD from the prestigious West Africa Center for Crop Improvement at the University of Ghana. Miriam has 12 years of experience in millet breeding, and she currently works uh, at the Lake Chad Research Institute in Maiduguri, Nigeria. She has led and managed several projects and contributed to variety development with currently three released varieties of millet to her credit, including one with bristle uh, that helps to limit bird damage. She's also focused on uh, biofortification or high iron and zinc varieties to help combat malnutrition. She has more than 20 publications in journals uh, and she is now supervising eight students uh, as part of her work. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Mariam Dawood to talk to us about the importance of millet. Over to you, Mariam. Thank you, Kevin, for the nice introduction. Um, I will talk about the importance of millet, the resilience, nutrition, value chain, income, and climate change. So my, and, and, um, my presentation will follow this outline. Um, before I start, I would like to talk about millet because some of us may not know what millet is. Millet are small seeded warm season cereal, cereal grains comprising of seven types. In broader sense, even sorghum, is under millet. They are for making it eight. And all these eight types of millet are being cultivated in, in India. But you, when you come down to Africa, only sorghum and pale millet are predominant among the seven, while finger millet is mainly cultivated in East Africa. So this is this finger millet that is looking like finger. Having seen the diversity, Let's look at the distribution at various hectares and tonnages. The area and production of millet are concentrated in the arid and semi-arid regions of Asia. When I talk about Asia, I'm talking about India. And Africa, predominantly West and Central Africa. One good thing about millet is that it is drought tolerant. 
It has deep root rooting system that allows it to extract moisture at deeper soil levels. It can give appreciable yield under low rainfall condition as low as 250 millimeters annual rainfall, making it an essential crop for African agriculture. Not only that, millet tolerates high temperature, as high as 45 degrees during reproduction, that is when it's a flowering, millet will still give you grain. Studies conducted by Waskal 2017 compared maize, millet, and sorghum for high temperature tolerance and found that with an increase in temperature by 1.5 degrees, there was a negative impact, that is a reduction in grain yield on both maize and sorghum, but not millet. When they further increased the temperature to two degrees, there was a significant reduction in the grain yield still in maize and sorghum, but not on millet. So this shows that millet is a suitable crop for this harsh climate, especially with the climate change scenario. This justifies why breeders make field crosses mostly in the early morning hours or late in the evening when temperature is low. It also requires low fertilizer than other cereals, meaning it is cost effective, meaning reducing input costs and then increasing the profitability. And this meat is an ideal choice for sustainable agriculture. That is why it is mostly grown by smallholder farmers, the poor resource farmers. Millet is a dual purpose crop, meaning the food, the, the grain is used as food, and then the stock is used as animal feed. It is a staple food for 90 million people. And studies have shown that over 60% of the world's population is deficient in iron and 60% deficient in zinc. So that means millet made work our easy, make our, easy, uh, our work easy by tackling malnutrition because it is rich in iron, zinc, potassium, phosphorus, and magnesium. Also, it's also a source of vitamins, such as riboflavin, niacin, and thymine. It has high fiber, which aids in digestion, and has low glycemic index, meaning it slowly releases sugar in the bloodstream. That's made it ideal for diabetic patients. In terms of innovation, millet is used in making bread, gluten-free cookies, gluten-free snacks, which is suitable for all age groups, the young ones and the aged. It is also used for making pasta, flowers, porridge, porridge for winning babies and for lactating mothers. The grain is packaged into 25 kg, 50 kg and 100 kg, and this makes it affordable for all social groups. And it's gender inclusive, that is one thing I like about millet. It is gender inclusive, meaning in terms of job creation and income generation, both male, female, and youths are involved in the processing and right from the production up to the final product. Having had all about how, having had all goodies about the millet, more investment is needed in especially the research and development. This is evident from this chart. We see that for the past 30 years, production area is almost the same from 1992 to 2020. It's almost the same while other cereals are advancing, that is uh, wheat and uh, others. Also, the, also, this is also the case with the production. It's also the same, almost the same. It's stagnant. There is no more increase like the other cereals. So one of the reasons is because more than 50% of the cultivated area in Africa is cultivated by smallholder farmers and on marginal lands. And these farmers cannot finance, can, cannot buy, um, I mean, uh, inputs, fertilizers. The ability to do so will increase only if the farmers grow more productive and market outlays become more accessible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariam. That was a very interesting and uh, actually maybe a little bit hungry seeing all your nice pictures about foods uh, of the millet. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. Let me remind the, the audience that we do have the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and please type your questions into the Q&A, and we will have uh, a Q&A session uh, towards the end of, of this hour. 
It's now really a great pleasure to introduce uh, our third speaker uh, for today or for this afternoon, morning or evening, as it may be for you. Uh, Dr. Mahalingam Govindaraj is a senior scientist at the Alliance of Biodiversity International and SEAT. He's the recipient of an extremely prestigious award, the Norman E. Borlaug Award for Field Research and Application, which he received in 2022. For those of you who don't know, this is the award that is given to young but very accomplished scientists. I think you have to be less than 40 when you receive it. And it is given at the same time as the World Food Prize uh, in Des Moines, Iowa, in recognition of global importance of the work. So it's really a great honor and privilege to have Dr. Govindaraj with us uh, in this seminar series, webinar series. He was awarded this for in recognition of his outstanding leadership in mainstreaming biofortified crops and for his work uh, in particular on iron enriched pearl millet in India and Africa. He was involved in developing the world's first biofortified pearl millet, after which he then led large scale dissemination efforts, which have then resulted in widespread use and coverage of these materials which are able to provide 80% of the recommended daily allowance of iron compared to only 20% in regular pearl millet varieties. Today, more than 120,000 farming households in India grow biofortified millet. And it's estimated that by 2024, more than 9 million people in India will be consuming iron and zinc rich pearl millet and living healthier lives as a result. In Sub-Saharan Africa, Dr. Govindaraj's bread varieties are now being grown in Kenya, Zimbabwe, Sudan, Niger, Nigeria, and Senegal. It's really a great privilege uh, to invite Dr. Govindaraj to share his presentation and his thoughts with us today. Over to you, Govindaraj. Thank you, Dr. Kevin. So sweet to uh, hear about me through your voice. Thank you so much. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening participants and colleagues and partners. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk about the millet biofortification. And many of you know that biofortification can be done in many approaches. So one of the approaches and sustainable way is the breeding approaches. I will be giving the background on the experience when we developed uh, uh, Harvest Plus and the uh, Ecrisat and national partners, both in India as well as in Africa. So you can learn some of the journeys, how we can come across. Before going to that, uh, let me show that challenge because many people that think that why biofortification is happen to be today and yesterday and may, may not be tomorrow. The challenge is 2 billion people is one or more micronutrient deficient across the world, especially developing world. When you put together all reports, the global report comes together, you know, with about 3 billion people. They don't have adequate micronutrient and vitamin on the daily basis, especially through the stable diets, which indicates that the green revolution in cereal production and many other crop production has a wonderful job. We need to appreciate that. However, there is a gradual decline in the nutrition is very well noticed in several literatures. So therefore, it's good to know that this cereal production has not solved the problem with the poverty and chronic nutrition in some of the regions, as said by Dr. Norman Ebola and reported in many CGR reports. It's therefore, it's time to make the central goal of crop production and food production. And this is for optimized for, you know, nutritional security in addition to food security. So food security is today is understood both food and nutrition together. It's not separately. Therefore, it is everyone's responsibility to understand and take the one of the approaches by fortification is not the only approach as a silver bullet. Let me give you some of the example, you know, uh, what the future food production or the future Really, the rural health depends upon the, the future of viable crop varieties, especially the stable food crops. I'm not showing the, all the green revolution varieties or the other mega cereals and the major stable foods, but I'm as the context of this topic, you know, I put the millet productivity scenario in over 40 years. This is from data from India. 
you can see the sorghum, pearl millet, finger millet, and the other minor millets. It shows a clear, uh, gradual uh, improvement in the productivity over the year. Of course, uh, my previous presenters uh, informed that with the less investment, this all happened with the less investment so far. This, of course, needed the more investment at least in the year of international year of millet and beyond. So what I'm trying to say is that if the food production is we achieved through the productivity and input based approach, and we need to look at the nutrition availability of the essential stable crop, it must look for the next generation or future adaptability uh, when it comes to the both uh, climate vulnerability or the population vulnerability. Therefore, the biofortification come into picture and the systematically one has to make a decision. So how to make the decision? One can be decided which crop and what nutrient to be biofortified. Therefore, Harvest Plus and partners developed, you know, the biofortification priority index, which is an interactive analytical tool. It's available publicly in the website. And it is also the data driven from about dozen crops from more than 120 countries. Here I put, you know, an example, Aaron Pellmillet, the dark blue shows that the top priority, the donors or the breeders or the policy makers has to focus uh, the important one. How we will be doing the biofortification, the first step, you know, set the baseline. Without the baseline, we can't, you know, measure or progress. The biofortification trait is largely classified in the three weeks based on the Copenhagen report as well as the World Health Organization priority at the time. I think this year is you now this 20th year after inception of biofortification program, global program. At the time, these are three micronutrients, you know, rated as a high important as per the, it, it is relevant to the both prevalence in, uh, in among the poor population and developing country. The uh, next things we need to notice here is the nutrient target is, is, is not just like a granule target. One has to understand biofortification has its own definition to increase its essential micronutrient and vitamin in edible parts of the stable crops that can have the measurable health impact after regular consumption. Therefore, the EAR come to the picture in addition to the you know, nutrition level as such. So these all put together and the nutrition team developed the baseline and target. The target is included is percentage of ER to EAR should be met in each and every crop. Today we are focusing pearl millet. I will be talking more about pearl millet and other millets. So where 47 is a global baseline, 77 is a global target. So for achieved the bio targeted biofortification is 83 ppm. So thanks to partners and donors for that. And there are other crops also made a significant progress, which is you can see in the, in the slides. I see that calcium is also one of the important traits is coming to together with other nutrients and selenium and other things. When it comes to millet is another advantage is the finger millet can be promoted for calcium as a naturally rich. And there is a feasibility study conducted by Harvest Plus team, and it shows that you know uh, you can get more than 50% as a EA or calcium from the finger millet than any other crops. Both for women, the dark and light one is for children. So it indicates that one can easily meet uh, based on the, uh, the biofortification or the promoting of the high level calcium variety. How this can be done? And many of you have the question. So breeders and commercial companies have handled large number of germplasm breeding pipelines. How to screen it is an invisible trait. Of course, this is a challenge in the inception of the Harvest Plus, but they gradually made the progress towards the, the technology which has been used long time in the mining industry. That is X-ray fluorescence spectrometry is now XRF in short. So we have now first, second, and even third generation XR of today is all evolved and for the plant application. And you can see the map, how many places the XR of is placed now uh, through the biofortification alliance and it works. Mostly in the CGR and also in the North uh, 
centers in Asia and South Asia, including in Africa. So this is a very important screen, you know, it's not needed much of the wet chemistry consumable. It's very cheap to operate like any, any, anybody who knows the computer, uh, less consumable and less cost compared to other things. So one can discard the low micronutrient and vitamin traits using this type of technology. But how to improve that precision, you know, in compared to the wet chemistry is also done with the help of Flinters University. Um, they developed the glass standards working with the manufacturer. You can see the picture here. This is a glass standard. It's specific to each crop. And the range you can see is a huge range in all crops, you know, rice, wheat, millet, maize, millet has the, the maximum variation so that it, it, you can capture the variation within that range in your breeding pipeline. Therefore, this is a very important game changer in biofortification. After doing analysis, you know, the breeders mostly interested are my crops has adequate genetic variability for the target traits? Of course, one has to assess that. And pearl millet is one of the example I can show here. It shows that the way I said the 47 is the target. And if you see this, almost, you know, 77, and, so, and this is a benchmark. If you put all the mainstreaming input, which is available at the time, and the commercial cultivars, there's more than 120 cultivars so far in India, and the core collection, and the biofortification targeted breeding, which is spent, you know, harvest plus uh, and donors, a lot of money on that, how this is, you know, built. You can see all the foremost cultivated and the commercial cultivars are below the uh, uh, range. In the green one, you can see the commercial one. So it is all less, and some of them, maybe 10% of had around uh, 50 ppm and more, but in an average, and uh, less than 45. So therefore, the uh, you, you must be aware, come across the you know, recommendation is the All India Coordinated Crop in India set the baseline 42 ppm for iron, 32 ppm for zinc. Interestingly, the mainstream breeding line, you can see the, the blue one is about, you know, close to 20% has the adequate amount of variability. You can exploit as quick as possible. I will, I will explain in the next slide how it is useful. But biofortification, of course, it is bred for a targeted traits, 98% of the line. Therefore, it is very important on us to focus on the trait breeding and integration. The fast track approach is followed, as I indicated in the previous slide. One can easily explore the main teaming line quickly, the seed parent pool and restorer, where the palmulet is cross-pollinated. One has to look for both OPV as well as you know hybrid like maize. So this is the phenotyping we did, and we extract the high FE O line and A line, and the seed parent pool, and it will go to the uh, female parent breeding and male parent breeding, and quickly those combination also tried and tested through the uh, dedicated you know partnership and the funding for quick release of the bio 44 variety, which is take the fast track approach, and similarly. And the OPV also is developed in such a way. So by doing so, that is is opportunity where the crop has you know a light background and high air, but otherwise we need to extract from the germplasm and other approaches. And this table is give you an snapshot that iron pearl millet tested in most of the countries in Africa, where the pearl millet is important and priority. I hope many of you, you know, some of you is are maybe already partnered with Ecrisat and the regional center. And this is a, a just a two years back update. And this is the first wave of biophotographic hybrids released in India and, and also in, in Africa, especially in Niger. And now today is in Nigeria, also released as Chakti and also included in the ECOWAS uh, document, which can be recommended for almost 15 states of Africa, say 15 country, countries of Africa. So this indicates that the yield potential is, you know, equally good, and you can see it's almost more than 50 to 80 uh, percent higher than the normal available commercial cultivars, the iron and zinc level. So this is very important and fast way of product, but mainstreaming should happen to produce more competitive variety. And some of you may be uh, participating, and you know, some of you are students or the faculty. And you interested to know what the trigenetics and its stability. You know, micronutrients are polygenic in nature, in you know, a quantitative inheritance, like any other quantitative trait. 
Based on the studies, I would say that in the platform is the formulated one of the crop which is done maximum strategic and breeding feasibility studies in terms of biofortification. So we found that in many crops and also in the formulates, additive gene action is the most prevalent for the micronutrient. And in some cases when you know additive gene interaction also is, is reported. It is highly heritable traits. You know, it's highly repeatability. You can see it is it is transferable to parent progenies. When it comes to G by E, it is a very important component when dealing with an invisible trait. We learned that, and we have much more data uh, and stored at Ecrisat as well. You can one can contact them. The G and G by E interaction is 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 important and significant, but it's much lesser than granule. One can easily you know predict. Uh, uh, the micronutrient, unless otherwise your soil is, you know, uh, deficient for the target nutrient. The negative effect you on yields, the effect on yield, is reported on the, and the, you know, on the random material or the main seeming material, but in, it is not always, you know, negative. There are uh, studies also focused and demonstrated the large population size to be selected and to break that. Uh, every high genetic and you know, a very high genetic variation available in most of the crops uh, which have been indicated in the previous slide and you know genomic is nowadays is a, a you know important one to fast track the breeding cycle uh, major QTLs are identified and are being in converted into you know uh, mid density or low density markers for screening and especially in the uh, segregating generation and XRF is one of the best options when marker is not available. You can quickly screen and discard the low FE material. And there are different methods is handled I, for the interest of the participant. You know, is open panicle is a given the best result in compared to all the methods and which is, is proven in formula. As I said, the, the genetic gain is important for yield and together with the micronutrient. And this slide shows that one of the pipeline hybrid trials, you know, is compared with the private sector commercial hybrids as well as the biofortified released one. So these are all the green one, it's, it's competition with, you know, uh, commercial hybrid. The red one is the public hybrids released uh, through the national system. It slowly indicates, it gradually indicates that there is a feasibility of mainstreaming both trite and polymer. And Harvest Plus work with the many partners, not just develop the variety and stay there. And, uh, and we will be collaborating uh, with the many of the seed and uh, development partners, including you know food processing and this. And the, this each value chain aspect tells that how important the nutrition and the feedback from the consumer. Therefore, I said in the previous, in the beginning of the slide, Crop improvement must be optimized for the customer as well when it comes to the rural population, as especially the nutrition strides should be valued in crop improvement as well as seed system, both research and investment. And for the interest of the business or the procurement or the policy development partners, you know, the grain has been least standardized so far in most of the crops. I, I mean to say the minor crops. So where comes the nutrition or biofortified grain, how they can distribute and classify and purchase. Therefore, the publicly available standards in collaboration with you know, uh, British Standard Institution has developed the standards called you know, PAS, publicly available standard, two, three, four dedicated for iron crops, both bean and pearl millet. And these standards is really, you know, enable the commercialization and scaling and partners, you know, is very important. This is focused mostly the content of the grain and its product is not on the technology used. Therefore, this is, uh, is cross-cutting one can use in the large-scale procurement. And India has also published that, you know, the biofortified variety is summarized by ICR, thanks to them, and this awareness is growing. What impact has been made so far? The investment has done in pearl millet, like other crops, it's really a significant impact made, as uh, Kevin mentioned in the introduction. The consumption of iron biofortified 
formulate significantly improved the iron status of the you know uh, uh, the group which has been fed four to six months and especially there are studies clinical studies confirm that iron deficiency is reversed after six months this is also the secondary benefits coming in cognitive other uh, ability and physical activity coming together as this is 80 percent of the daily iron can be uh, met when they consume the regular quantity is is two to 200 to 250 gram per day so this is the number which indicates how many households growing uh, both in india as well as in africa as today we all in one CG transition, many of the partners and CG knows that the must-have traits is in the target product profile. And Pearl Millet is already begin and it is and the national uh, program already you know supported 42 ppm iron and zinc, 32 ppm zinc as a principle in cultivar testing, irrespective of the trial. Therefore, it really will go to the competitive product when you have this, you know, the stage gate advances. And as a mainstreaming prospect, I would say the strategy, easy way to that product profile is, is, is CGI Crisat and other CG center closely fixing that uh, 60 ppm FE, 35 ppm C, which is you know, almost more than 50% of the target, which is very essential where the parental material is mobilized to the various stakeholders. And these standards really boost the GA, the level of nutrition beside other agronomic traits. And also the good idea to replace the 10% of the parent in a light uh, background uh, in every year crossing block that would boost that, you know, genetic gain. And XRF diagnostic markers are already available and that can be used for early generation selection or the late uh, generation using XRF. And this one slide are interesting for the uh, interest of the breeders. You can see that, you know, each segregating generation is after segregating till finish. So this F3 to F7 for both uh, B by B or the seed parent group or the pollinator group, which gradually move the population need. So it is an easy way to, you can select based on the XRF. And so far we done. The main steaming should begin as quick as possible. The palmulators begin already and other crops should happen quickly. Therefore, the targeted breeding investment and capacity gradually, you know, transition to the main steaming part. It makes sense that the gradually it's the biofortification targeted breeding can be closed, I would say, when the biofortification a mainstream product is available through the mainstreaming from that day. Uh, this is my last slide. The opportunities are, you know, huge, I would say, in terms of millet. The nutrition is as irritable traits like um, other, you know, uh, uh, flowering or maturity traits. It's recommended in current and future crop varieties through various target product profile or the national or regional policies. However, the seed production and scaling is still is, 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 is not the uh, level it's supposed to happen in the biofortified crops. Maybe the network partners and project can scale, especially in Africa, and to, re to have the real impact and demonstration. It is must to have a lens, uh, you know, the, uh, rather than working in isolate. It is good to have the mainstreaming target crops, those targeted crops, not every crop to be mainstream where some of the crops need pre-breeding. Say, for example, you know, in other millets, uh, in the sorghum, we have done a lot of pre-breeding works uh, compared to uh, other crops. Sorghum also can be, you know, targeted for the mainstreaming. However, other millets need pre-breeding, other legumes, uh, uh, even cowpea, uh, PGNP, chickpea, all those things that need pre-breeding in the CG as well as NARS uh, to acute that level uh, we have made in other crops. Biofortification priority index, I think that helps uh, developing in those additional crops and capacity development is very much important uh, for the uh, mainstreaming as well as the targeted breeding in other crops. Uh, Miller Nutrition Atlas database is, is the one way we can progress and uh, win alignment with the market segment and also need more efficacy study for Africa in case we need to rise, you know, much more resources for that. Private public sector partnership is the key and we can't, you know, ignore and we cannot underestimate the power of that partnership for our 4D 
and also commercialization in trial and crops, uh, both in Asia and Africa. Resource mobilization for dry land crop is very much need of the day. And you know, through networking partnership, as I said, Alliance will bring and that type of opportunity rather than you know, uh, working in, in, in different areas. Uh, positioning bio fortified variety uh, is climate change. We are uh, you know, seeing one or other farms in front of us. Uh, positioning bio fortified varieties in relation to the climate aspect is really going to give you boost both in resource and capacity and modeling aspect is very important. Therefore, I would say the nutrition indicator and risk projection, both for climate and population, Millet brings greater opportunity. Thank you so much for all the partners, including Agrisat, ICR, and CG donors. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Govindaraj, for an exciting and stimulating presentation. It, it, it indeed stimulated many questions, which we're very thankful for, and we have several minutes to respond to some of them. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, first, um, I'm going to ask first for uh, a few questions for Mariam, uh, and then a couple for Govindaraj, and then, then maybe one or two also for, for Harish. So Mariam, there were several questions and I'll give you three so that you can respond to three uh, together. Uh, one question is, uh, which is the most important of the millets? Uh, and then uh, another question, which I would put together with that is, why do we talk about the millets as if it was only one millet? We really need to differentiate between the different millets because they have very different uh, characteristics. And then the one that I really like uh, is because you mentioned that millets is uh, a woman's crop or something to that effect. Uh, but the question is really that um, it's not attractive for urban households where wives and husbands are working because millets require a lengthy time for preparation, for consumption. So can you respond to those really two questions? I'm sorry, Kevin. Can we please take you to one at a time? The first question is, I'm sorry. <laughs> The first question is, which is the most important millet? And why do we talk about just one millet and not about all the millets instead of differentiating and talking individually about the many types of millets? Um, I think from the presentation, as I was saying, um, it's not only one type of millet that is important. It depends on the region. For we at the WCA, pale millet is more important to us and sorghum. And when you go to the East Africa, is finger millet. If you are in India, it's all the seven types of millet. So it depends on where you are. Okay, and what about, um, some, somebody is indicating that millets can be unattractive to the urban households because they require a lengthy time to prepare for consumption. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's true. It takes a lengthy time for you to process if you are doing it at a um, smaller scale. At the, at the household level for you to kind of trace and then we know do all this processing. Yes, it takes a lot of time, but I think it works. Since for now, we are just starting um, kind of at the small uh, smallholder farmers uh, level. Um, they can still go ahead with it before they get um, kind of the big machineries to do all these things for them. But it works doing it because of its importance. It's affordable it's for, for now, it's affordable, it's accessible, and then they can just grow it around wherever they are. It's not something they can import from somewhere else. So I think it's good for them to use what they have for now. And we are working on it to kind of make it industrialized. Okay, thank you. Um, Govindaraj, uh, could you comment about the use of marker-assisted selection or QTLs in your breeding? Uh, there's a question whether you did only by selection or whether you also used selection for markers. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, when I was at Ecrisat, this is developed and is being verified at the time, uh, I think before COVID. And uh, in the so far, the product released is through the regular breeding program. But now the uh, marker application is gradually started because only four markers are available for the iron and zinc. 
uh, not many markets are available and SNP and those were used for you know uh, screening of early generation material used largely for you know discarding the low FE and losing material in the F2s. Okay, can you comment about the correlation between zinc and iron uh, for pearl millet and whether uh, there's a, a relationship also with, with higher fiber content? Yeah, the iron and zinc are always you know, correlated positively and significantly in pearl millet and in many other crops, both cereals and legumes. Uh, plenty of literature is available and it has, you know, uh, it's not just in a biofortified line itself, it is also in other uh, random material as well, the strength is same. Uh, the second one, I couldn't follow that high fiber, is correlation you are mean? Yeah, the, the, actually the question was, does the high fiber content um, reduce the bioavailability or the avail lead to reduce the availability of iron and zinc uh, in pearl millet? Yeah, uh, in general, it's uh, not very specific aware that and it's not deeper. Research has been done that level after post-harvest and food system, but however, the clinical studies on bioavailability efficacy study reported that, you know, seven to eight percent of the bioavailable for iron, whereas uh, more than 20 percent for zinc and pearl millet. There is no difference uh, uh, bioavailable between biofortified and non-biofortified because that bioavailability is, is, you know, it's not bread. It is, it is same as the both in a crop in nature, but where you get advantage when you're meeting the breeding target because the percentage will meet the EAR. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mariam, you were showing us pictures about processed foods. Uh, there's a question whether pearl millet can be used to reduce the need for wheat flour. So it can be used in blends to successfully make products from blended flours using pearl millet. Can you tell us about that? Yes, please. We have tried that in my institute and it worked. So we we'll mix some flours with wheat and millet, wheat and maize, wheat and sorghum, and then especially with the wheat and millet to make snacks and then it worked. How much, how much percent of pearl millet flour could you use successfully? 60, 40. 60 wheat and 40 millet. Wow, that, that's a very high percentage. I'm sure it's very nutritious uh, products. Yeah. Now, the second question is a little more controversial. The millet yields remain very low. So what are breeders doing to improve the millet yield? This question um, I think... Right. Am I too? Yes, please, Marion. Uh, uh, all right. Yeah, breeders are really working. And um, as we <laughs> kept saying, it's an orphan crop. We are just starting. So we can just not change everything at a time. Gradually, we'll be there. But we are really working. For example, in Nigeria, we have 2 million people. And then because I released three varieties just this year, I cannot say they will change everything at a time just this year. So it's gradual, but we are really working to get out the seed system. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Govinda Raj, uh, there's a question about uh, millet in India. Uh, can it really help meet the demand of proper and nutritious diets for India's population, uh, meeting the future needs uh, of the growing population? Yeah, millet is, you know, uh... Uh, specifically consumed in uh, uh, selected states, especially Rajasthan in Maharashtra and little in Pan India, South India. The post harvest technology, as both in processing as well as food product making, is not really scaled or demonstrated. I think this International Year of Mill at the various event I, I also participated is now coming as many entrepreneurs and industry for making the food from the various millet. Therefore, there is a huge opportunity. There are new, new technologies even available, you know, the institute dedicated for the post-harvest and food technology. 
uh, we are also working started working with them as i mentioned you know the, the valley chain the food product processing also is now is the next step when to scale the bio fortified one especially where we talk about the nutrition therefore we are very close to you know uh, to reach that type of uh, impact and making the bio fortified product i think in beans in africa as well as in latin america the bio fortified beans are already available based foods and in in india there is no specific food it's largely we targeted for the you know farming community who really is a vulnerable so they largely consume so slowly the surplus is produced and really it will reach as a market as a food and various options yeah excellent thank you but here's a very specific question for you uh, what is the average effect of biofortification on grain yield of pearl millet? That's uh, a slide also I indicated. The average yield is, you know, three times per hectare, all the biofortified hybrids. If some of the hybrids went even 3.6, the average is three. Is that question? Well, I guess I guess you're telling us that there's no negative correlation between biofortification and yield, or or is there a negative correlation? Yeah, I I, I given in the slide itself, you know, is the biofortification trait is not necessarily low lower the yield. <laughs> However, there is a negative trend which is not significant. I would say uh, there are publication and there is a data generator from various partners is available. But this has to be tested uh, largely uh, when we do the mainstreaming, you know, part. So when mainstreaming is largely you are incorporating with the higher yield background, then we need to take into consideration a simultaneous selection. However, as I mentioned, as a strategy like any other trades, any other bad drag, you know, bad linkages, as I always, if there is approach, we don't have to select a large population. I will not say there is a negative effect, but that this can be addressed, provided yeah. these traits can be included in the selection criteria. Yeah. So. Okay, but if the if you said, yeah, I think you said that there's a negative trend, but it's not significant. Well, as a scientist, to me, that means it's not correlated. It's zero effect. It's if it's not significant. Yeah. But anyway, at least it can be dealt with. It's not a major. It's not an important uh, hindrance. I'd like yeah, to ask one example. Question. Yeah, go ahead. Well, one example I can quote here, there is, you know, one of the private sector hybrid is a scored the highest iron level, which is bred for yield, so which is commercialized and it is a large market share at the time, I think, uh, five years back. So it is indicates that, you know, that it is not always, you know, yield barriers when you breed for biophotified rights. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Govindaraj. now a question for Harish. Uh, comes in, in. The question is that unleashing the power of millets will require NARS support or support to the national programs for population improvement in African plant breeding programs. What is the plan of the dryland crops to support capacity building for the NARS programs? Yeah, thank you for that question, Kevin. So specifically, as I was mentioning on my slide, you know, we have brought together the NARS program of 17 different countries together. And what we're currently doing is we're systematically assessing each of the program and understanding what the needs and the gaps are, uh, more uh, on the infrastructure side as well as on the human capacity side. Uh, actually, just uh, today, for example, we're meeting with the uh, Eastern Southern Africa Steering Committee of uh, about eight NARS uh, here and discussing some of the capacity needs uh, which exist in, in this region. Uh, so basically, what we require is a systematic uh, evaluation and systematic investment over multiple years. And I think it will be a, a significant effort uh, because our assessment suggests that, you know, there are, you know, programs which will require a significant investment, but there are some programs in which have made a lot of investment themselves uh, through the uh, international projects as well as through their uh, country governments. Thank, thanks, Harish. Uh, Mariam, a, a very specific question for you. Uh, what is the maturity period of the bristled millet that you released? All the three are early maturing. So it's about 75, 75 days. Excellent. Now a question for all three of you. Just a quick yes or no. 
Do we need to prioritize hybrid millets among farmers to increase yield potential? Maryam, yes or no, hybrids? Yes. Govindaraj, yes or no, hybrids? Yes. Harish, yes or no, hybrids? Yes, big yes. Okay, everybody on the phone <laughs> call, yes or no, hybrids? <laughs> Definitely, yeah. maybe. No, thank you. It sounds like hybrids could certainly make a contribution uh, to yield improvement. Now, we're running out of time, but there were several questions. I just want um, maybe to ask um, Govindaraj to answer something about seed systems. Is there something we can do to strengthen seed systems to better reach farmers with improved varieties? The safe system, as far as India is concerned, I think is better shaped. I think it is, it's, it can be once it's released, it's taken care of both in public and private sector. When it comes to Africa, I think we need to work a lot and implement some of the success model from other countries, especially from Asia, where the millet is, millet country replicated successful model uh, and similar consortia can be repeated over there. Uh, it's not just alone the seed system and also for the development of the parental line and distribution testing networks. This all uh, cross talk each other. Therefore, the seed system can be strengthened because seed system need a continuous flow of material uh, uh, from the research organization or the breeding organization. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much for that. We're we're almost out of time. I want to. I'm going to end with a question for everybody, but before I do that, I want to thank our speakers, uh, Harish, Maryam, Govindaraj, really thankful for an excellent uh, series of presentations, stimulating and very interesting also Q&A discussions. Thank you to everyone on the call uh, for making it such an exciting and lively uh, discussion period. And now my question for all of you, which comes from one of you, if millets are so important and we all know it, why are we? Why did we wait until today to get started working and promoting millets? Okay, so ask yourself, why today? Why not 10 years ago or 20 years ago? Of course, Govindaraj was doing it 10 years ago, uh, but why not sooner? Why now? And then the second question is, you know, what can we do uh, to really increase the impact of millets? And I think that's all of our jobs. And so I'll leave you with that thought uh, to reflect upon what can you do to increase the impact of millets uh, to help resource poor farmers and consumers around the world for better nutrition and food security. Thank you everyone very much uh, for helping us launch this uh, series of seminars about and webinars about millets. Uh, I wish you all a happy remainder of your day or a pleasant evening as the case may be. Goodbye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Finally, you show yourself, Govindaraj. <laughs> <laughs>